Far Eastern University Public Intellectual Lecture Series. My name is Rita Cusho and I am from the Political Science Department. Our topic for today on media ethics is both timely and relevant, and we are privileged to have one of the pillars of Philippine Press. He is the former dean of the University of the Philippines College of Mass Communication and a trustee of the Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility. He's none other than Professor Luis V. Teodoro. Good day, sir. Good day. And thank you for accommodating our request. You're uh, welcome. And uh, it's quite exciting for us to discuss something, especially in this post-truth era. And sir, my first question, since our audience will be our students in FEU, is for you to help us understand what media ethics is and why is it important today in the era of fake news and alternative facts? Well, to put it briefly, um, media ethics refers to the standards of behavior appropriate to media practice. Now, what does appropriate to media practice mm -hmm. mean? Well, that means that we have to talk about what, what the media are mm -hmm. and what their, purpose, uh, mm -hmm. what their purposes are. The main purpose of media, of course, is to provide information mm -hmm. And uh, as well as analysis and interpretation. Mm -hmm. So anything that hinders those functions, mm -hmm. anything that, uh, that makes uh, providing information mm -hmm. or providing analysis and mm -hmm. interpretation difficult mm -hmm. is unethical. Mm -hmm. But that must be modified mm -hmm. because it also includes, media ethics also includes being aware of the impact of what the media practitioner is doing on the subject, on his subjects, mm -hmm. as well as on the public. Mm -hmm. So that means that you have to be careful about what you say mm -hmm. if you're on broadcasting, in broadcasting, or what you write mm -hmm. if you're in print, mm -hmm. or uh, again, what you say if you're online. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have to be aware of its impact on people. Mm -hmm. On the people that you're writing about, mm -hmm. for example, you can destroy a reputation. No? or as well as on the public as a whole. For example, the public can, can emerge uh, disinformed mm -hmm. about issues if you don't do it, if you don't practice, if you don't practice ethical mm -hmm. uh, journalism, for example, no? or professional journalism. So, so media ethics refers to, to is, is specific to what the media are. I mean, we know, for example, that there are uh, there are e codes of ethics for for doctors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what decides uh, the code of ethics for doctors is the character of medical practice. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, in other words, you're not supposed to you're not you're supposed to cure rather mm -hmm. than harm, and so on. And then you, ha you also have uh, uh, codes of ethics for lawyers. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as lawyers are concerned, you're supposed to what? You're supposed to defend the innocent mm -hmm. and, and see that justice is done mm -hmm. because that's the character of the law profession. Mm -hmm. Now, in journalism and in the rest of media, uh, the fact that the media are all about information mm -hmm. therefore shapes the ethics. Mm -hmm. So let us say uh, you have, uh, you're reporting on what happened uh, at the Reed Bank mm -hmm. or the Recto Bank. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and you don't have enough information, mm -hmm. for example. No? So you have to, to be careful uh, that to, to get the information mm -hmm. by consulting many, many sources, mm -hmm. a number of sources. Mm -hmm. So one of the standards, for therefore, of journalism, mm -hmm. for example, is multi-sourcing. Mm -hmm. You get as many sources as possible. Mm -hmm. And that is crucial to certain, that is crucial to one fundamental principle in journalism, and that is the principle of truth-telling. Okay, okay. Uh, journalists are supposed to report the truth. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are a lot of people who will say, but what is truth? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> anyway, journalism assumes that there is a truth out there mm -hmm. that you can discover. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's saying that there is a truth it's not saying that there are alternative truths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's saying that there are truth. Mm -hmm. There is a truth out there that can be discovered and which therefore you can report. Mm -hmm. You must report. Now, how do you do that? How do you, how, how, how do you, how are you certain that you, what you're reporting mm -hmm. is the truth? You have to, mul to, to consult m multiple sources. You have to do research. Mm -hmm. You have to consult experts and so on. Now, for example, if you're talking about the Reed Bank, okay, President Duterte says, uh, I, well, I entered into an agreement with President Xi Jinping of China to allow Chinese fishermen to, to fish in the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. Now, the, one of the questions that you would raise is, okay, is that allowed? Mm -hmm. So you end up 
talking to somebody who may be uh, to an expert on the Constitution. No? So you end up talking to Justice Carpio, for example. Or uh, also, if you're, to, if, you're, uh, if you're thinking about, uh, but what will that do to our marine resources? Then you end up talking to somebody who's an expert on, uh, on marine sciences, uh, as well as you consult documents as well. So that means that you have, you have to get, try to get at the truth by consulting a number of sources. Now that means, therefore, that as far as truth-telling is concerned, if a report is based only on one source, mm -hmm. then that can be ethically questionable. Then you can say, oh, well, is that, the, is that really the truth? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we know that what he's saying is true? No? So that becomes, uh, there, are an, there are ethical issues mm -hmm. that arise when, let us say, a report mm -hmm is only based on a single source. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the person who's evaluating uh, news reports, for example, will look for, okay, did he exhaust all possibilities, all possible sources here, in order to get at mm -hmm. the truth? Because we all know that the truth is sometimes very difficult to get at. Yes. But there is a truth out mm -hmm. there. That is the assumption of journalism. Mm -hmm. no? so, so in order to do that, you have to do all of this. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as far as truth telling is concerned, you also have to provide context. Mm -hmm. Because one of, the, one of the failings, one of the ethical failings of much of Philippine journalism mm -hmm. is the failure to provide context. Mm -hmm. For example, okay, you have, uh, I can mention one case, um, you had the war in Mindanao. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in 2000, uh, then, President, then President Joseph Estrada declared all-out war in Mindanao. Okay. So that me what that meant is that the uh, Philippine media covered mm -hmm. what was happening in Mindanao and so on. So they generated so many stories and so on and so forth. And s the Center for Media Freedom Responsibility did a study on how the war in Mindanao then was being covered. And we found out that out of about 6,000 articles, reports over broadcasting, uh, reports in print, and so on and so forth, only about, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but I think only about seven reports provided some background on the conflict. Um, there, was one, there was one particular case in which, the, which provided context and which enabled people to understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, this, was a, this was an interview in the Inquirer with then the late Salamat Hashim, who was head of the MILF at the time. And, and, uh, and they asked, among others, Salamat Hashim, they asked Salamat Hashim, what does the MILF want? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's part of the context. No? So you can see that, uh, okay, there are encounters, there are shootings, and so on and so forth, and there are casualties. Much of the media was just saying, okay, so many people died, so many people were killed, and so on and so forth. But they didn't point out, what is this conflict all about? No? Same thing is the same thing is happening today, for example, in reporting uh, the clashes between the NPA and, and the AFP. Okay, so so many people dead, so many people, uh, so many people injured, uh, houses burned, and so on and so forth. But a lot, of, but many people uh, lack the information that would enable them to understand what is this war all about. No, okay. So, for example, also during the during the peace talks, the aborted peace talks between the Philippines and the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. There was um, between the government of the Philippines, I'm sorry, and the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. There, there was no information on what the NDFP wanted. Mm -hmm. And yet, the National Democratic Front of the Philippines has a 12-point program. Mm -hmm. but, no, but none of the reports even mentioned that, no, and so on. So that all, the, all of these things can be, so in other words, you have conflict. Conflict reporting is a particularly difficult area of reporting. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know there are people take sides and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. No? Okay, so what happens? What what happens if you don't provide the context is that people misunderstand or people don't have any understanding of what's going on or they get confused. For example, in 2000 during the the war in Mindanao thing, there were instances. There was one instance in which a woman, a, a Muslim woman, wearing wearing the hijab, was prevented from entering a restaurant, and the security guard even pointed a gun at her. Because of the assumption that okay, these Muslims are just violent and uh, and and unreasonable and so on, and that everyone is dangerous, mm -hmm. 
but because of the lack of context in much of the reporting of media. So truth telling requires, okay, uh, being factual. And, uh, and being factual means, uh, getting the facts means consulting many sources. But it also requires research as well as uh, providing a history. Mm -hmm. so, 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 uh, so that people will understand. Okay, so in the case of the reporting on the, re on, on the Red Bank incident, okay, what is this all about? Uh, what is the exclusive economic zone? I mean, I know that, 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 that there has been talk about that, what is the exclusive economic zone? what are the Philippines' territorial waters, and so on. But it's necessary to recall, mm -hmm. to recall that. Mm -hmm. To provide, in other words, the point is to provide some kind of background. Mm -hmm. So that's as far as truth-telling is concerned. And truth-telling is really fundamental in mm -hmm. media ethics. Mm -hmm. So in accuracy, mm -hmm. disinformation, mm -hmm. disinformation means, uh, you know, uh, lying, actually. Mm -hmm. Misinformation, meaning defective, distorted information. I mean, these are all contrary to the ethical principle of truth-telling in journalism. So, so now the, the next question is, why is this important? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's important for, for, uh, for people to understand what the ethics of media are so that they will demand mm -hmm. that the media perform according to their own ethical and professional standards because okay in the philippine setting and in the set in, in 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 many other parts of the world the media are commercial enterprises mm -hmm. and as commercial enterprises the media will listen to the market mm -hmm. and the market are the people mm -hmm. so if the people demand that do this do a better job mm -hmm. and follow your own standards mm -hmm. follow your own ethics then uh, the media will do a better job. No? Why, is, why is it necessary for the media to do a better job? So that we can understand what's happening, so that the people can understand, well, to put it, to put it in a grand way, mm -hmm. to understand the world. I mean, that's what, that's what it's all about. The media are supposed to, to enable us to understand the world. For what purpose? So that we can, we can evaluate what's happening and act as free men and women because mm -hmm. We are all familiar with the, with the cliche, the injunction that mm -hmm. the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. Well, in that sense, the media help us get at the truth. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, help liberate us. Mm -hmm. Because when you have information, mm -hmm. then you can act in an informed manner. Mm -hmm. And my illustration about this is, okay, how do we prevent dengue? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, so how do we avoid getting dengue? We avoid getting dengue by understanding the, the life cycle of the mosquito and how it transmits dengue. And when you understand that process, mm -hmm. then therefore you can act to prevent getting dengue. And that is a form of liberation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not just the subject of, uh, of laws that you cannot understand and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And basically that's what the media, the media, the media are. The media help provide the knowledge about this world mm -hmm. that will enable us to understand it mm -hmm. and that can enable us to be free mm -hmm. from just merely being the subjects of things that we don't mm -hmm. understand. So it is that important. Mm -hmm. So in the case, for example, in the, in, in, as far as governance, for example, is concerned, okay, what is, what is foreign policy? Mm -hmm. What is the foreign policy of the present uh, administration? Then. Uh, understanding that we can we can either be critical of it, mm -hmm. we can approve of it, mm -hmm. or we can demand that it be changed mm -hmm. no, on the basis of our understanding of it. Now the media can help us understand mm -hmm. that. I'm not saying that that only the media can do this. Mm -hmm. there, there is of course the educational system. There is the home. There are, mm -hmm. there is literature or science. But the media are among those institutions mm -hmm. that m that humanity has developed. Mm -hmm to enable us to understand what the world is like. Mm -hmm. And if necessary, this is important. Mm -hmm. If in understanding that world, mm -hmm. we see that there are certain things that are wrong with it, it enables us to mm -hmm. uh, have the means and have the knowledge rather to demand certain changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how important, mm -hmm. the, important the media are. And, and as far as democracy is concerned, for example, I mean, you know, uh, how do we provide, how do we, how do we make 
democracy a reality in the <laughs> Philippines. My own view is that journal is that democracy is not yet complete in the Philippines. That it is that there is a democratization process that is going on, and political science people will. I mean, I know several professors in UP who are saying, "My God, the democratization process in the Philippines has been has been what perennial. It's been going on, no end in sight, and so on and so forth." Well, uh, media can contribute to the dem democratization process by arming people, the citizenry, with enough information mm -hmm. for them to exercise their sovereign, sovereign right mm -hmm. to demand change mm -hmm. and so on, and to, and to criticize government policy and mm -hmm. so forth. So it's that important, mm -hmm. actually. Wow, thank you so much for that, sir. And the thing that you brought up about Philippine democracy and its relationship with ma mass media uh, reminded me of your personal background, and that is the fact that you were a political prisoner during the Marcos dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And because you were a political prisoner and a journalist at the same time, right after uh, Edsa Revolution took place, I would like to ask you, sir, to evaluate how media then and media now can be can be compared media then during the martial yes, law period during the martial law period how difficult it was and what were the challenges that you faced during that time what mm -hmm. uh, ethical dilemmas you face as a journalist and how does it fare with what is happening now with the philippine media well uh, during uh, well one of the first things that the marcos uh, dictatorship did and and let's not uh, let's not look at it differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a dictatorship. I know that there are a lot of younger people who say it was a better time and so on and so forth. But anyway, it was a dictatorship. Anyway, one of the first things that the Marcos dictatorship did was to shut down media organizations and to arrest mm -hmm. practitioners. They arrested a number of journalists and mm -hmm. so on. No? So they shut down print and radio and television. So, and then later on, they, they set up certain agencies mm -hmm. to to regulate mm -hmm. the media. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a consequence, uh, you could be arrested yes. if uh, you violated certain rules mm -hmm. that the Marcos uh, dictatorship had put in place mm -hmm. regarding media practice. Mm -hmm. So if you were critical of the first family, for example, no, mm -hmm. then you could be arrested. And I know, I know of several instances, several cases in which uh, um, uh, Two gossip columnists, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. were arrested just because they earlier they had said something about mm -hmm. Mrs. Marcos. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, one of them said that uh, that the miscarriage of Mrs. Marcos, which was supposed to be in the news at, mm -hmm. before, just before martial law, mm -hmm. Mrs. Marcos was supposed to have had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he said in his gossip column, uh, they didn't bury because because they they supposedly buried the fetus. Mm -hmm. And he said in his column, they didn't bury a fetus, they buried a hollow block. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so he was arrested uh, when martial law was declared. Mm -hmm. okay. There was also another gossip columnist who was saying, you know, uh, uh, there was, uh, there's all this, uh, um, uh, Mrs. Marcos loves shoes and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. She was also arrested mm -hmm. and so on. No? But of course, there are also other other journalists who were uh, who were uh, reporting in politics, who were who were uh, writing columns, who were also arrested, as well as a number of reporters. Mm -hmm. So they they were arrested. They were kept in in prison without charges mm -hmm. for a number of months and some for years actually. Mm -hmm. no? So well, in my case, I was arrested uh, uh, because I was told only later when I was about to be released. <laughs> I was arrested for cite writing certain articles in in the Philippines Free Press, Graphic Magazine, and Asia Philippines Leader. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, before martial law, it was the golden age of magazines. Mm -hmm. You had magazines that were that had big circulations mm -hmm. relatively. For example, Free Press used to have sixty thousand a mm -hmm. uh, sixty thousand circulation every every week, no? And there was a there was a magazine I was writing for when martial law was declared. Uh, called uh, Asia Philippines Leader, edited by Nick Joaquin, our uh, our first national artist. Anyway, um, so they arrested people also from this, and and uh, and I was arrested because they said you wrote these articles and so on and so forth. And I said, why was it illegal <laughs> at the time? I mean, at the time it wasn't illegal to write all of this, and now you're saying it's illegal. Okay, anyway, but at the same time they also said, okay, you were in UP and you knew these persons. 
I mean, of course, I knew these persons mm-hmm. because some of them were my classmates. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I knew Nur Miswari. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew Jose Maria Sison and mm-hmm. so on. But in any case, uh, in any case, what happened was that later on the press was regulated, and so you could, and so if you wrote for uh, for the press that was supposed to have been legalized, mm-hmm. uh, there, there was an illegal press and there was an underground mm-hmm. press. Anyway, the, the legal press, okay, if you were writing for the legal press, okay, the, the editors will say, Wag naman ganito. I mean, let's be, let's be realistic. I mean, you know, I mean, we have to be careful about this. So what happened was that, of course, you couldn't say a lot of things. No? So my reaction at that time was, uh, oh my, uh, writing has ceased to be fun. <laughs> it is no longer fun. <laughs> anyway, uh, so at the same time, there was uh, the underground press. It was in the underground press they were reporting where they were reporting the human rights violations and so on and so forth. Then later on, there were there were the there was the press that was semi underground mm-hmm. because uh, they were above ground, but mm-hmm. they could be stopped at at any time. No, and I was part of I was part of a news agency called Philippine News and Features, which was published by the by the Catholic Bishops Conference. So it was reporting on human rights and so on and so forth. But, but we knew that at any time, because they, you, were, you were above ground, you could be stopped. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the, one of the, one of the problems. So, so, so it wasn't so much an ethical dilemma. We understood, for example, one thing, that while certain things were illegal, mm-hmm. as far as the regime was concerned, mm-hmm. They were also, it was also ethically necessary mm-hmm. for you to report them. Mm-hmm. In other words, the law says this, mm-hmm. but the ethics of journalism says this mm-hmm. at the time. For example, the ethics of journalism says you have to tell the truth. Mm-hmm. You have to report the truth. Mm-hmm. So, we, so there were a number of articles that appeared, for example, in uh, Philippine News and Features. And one of the, one of the writers was, is, in fact, very active today, Alan Robles. Mm-hmm. And Alan Robles used to write these satirical pieces, you know, making fun of, uh, of the regime and so on, of the Marcos regime and so forth. And we thought that that was, uh, that was necessary. Also, there were reports on, okay, what, the, what are they doing now? Well, uh, some of the articles pointed out, they did this also during the Japanese occupation mm-hmm. and so on. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really, it, the, the dilemma actually was between, okay, the regime was saying you can't say these things, mm-hmm. but journalists, the, jo- the ethics of journalism was saying you have to say these things mm-hmm. because you have to report the truth. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't so much an ethical dilemma, but a, the qu- a question of whether you would be uh, you're willing to take the risk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then later on, I was in uh, in a magazine called Midweek, mm-hmm. also during the martial law period, and. Uh, and Midweek also tried to do the same thing and so on. No? But we were constantly aware of the possibility that we could always, that we could be stopped mm-hmm. and so on. Now today, I think, I think today, uh, supposedly uh, the, the pre expression, press freedom, and free speech mm-hmm. are protected by the Constitution. Now you have Article 3, Section 4. Okay. But uh, the problem is that. Uh, uh, increasingly, under the, the Duterte regime, no, the media are being, there's a lot of harassment on, on the media, a lot of threats, and so on. And sin- from 1986 onwards, uh, 165 journalists have been killed in the Philippines. And that has put us in the map of the media watch groups all over the world as one of the most dangerous places in the world to practice journalism. So these are continuing, the killings are continuing. For example, since 2016, when President Duterte became president, there have been 12 journalists killed. So, and, but in addition, you have uh, a number of threats, harassments, and, and attacks on the press. Uh, for, uh, although, although press freedom is guaranteed, mm-hmm. You have, however, all these attacks, no? So, which is, I think, which is really a paradox because, because the thing is, Article 3, Section 4 requires the government to protect press freedom and free expression. No? That is what 
But that's what's implicit there. No law may be passed, abridging, and so on and so forth. No? Okay. But what's happening is that there are these attacks on the press and, and threats on the press coming from government. Mm 